So, welcome. Oops, we got we got you stuck on the screen, my dear. Let's see here. Look up in the corner and see if you've got um your clicked on something. I have speaker view. Does, do people see me? Yes, River. Okay, you do? Okay. Okay, I just don't see myself at all. Okay, so welcome to Up Close, Meet the Poet Behind the Verse. I am your host, River Maria Erke, and here to help me pull this off is a mutual poet, Julie Martin. Hello, everybody. Up Close, up, um, up close, we showcase a new poet each month with this with this um, interview, a poetry reading, and a giveaway. Our focus or our goal is to introduce the person behind the poems. And before we start, I need to ask our Zoom audience to remain muted during the duration of the show. And we do encourage audience questions. You can put in the chat. And um, at the end, if we have time, we'll dive into that. Um, we will have a giveaway later, and I'll give you the details. Um, I need to give a shout out to our sponsors, LUMP, the League of Amer Minnesota Poets. And then um, I remind us all we're being recorded and that we're live on Facebook. So with that, now sit back and enjoy. Um, I'd like to introduce to all of you our up close October poet, Sarah Degner Riveros. There is never a dull moment in Sarah's world between children and papers, chickens and laundry. Her days are full and rewarding. A little history is Sarah was born in Chicago and grew up near Dallas, Texas. She received her undergraduate from the University of Illinois Urbania in 97, then ventured to the Big Apple for graduate school until 2004. She finished her thesis, thesis in 2007 from the kitchen table, earning herself a doctorate in Spanish literature from Columbia University. She spent the next decade or so in Indiana, building her family and learning the art of gardening and the importance of chickens. In 2015, Sarah and her five children moved to Minnesota to escape and ensure a fresh start to a new life. She began to teach Spanish at Augsburg University and they rented a four bedroom house with a yard. Today, they live on the east side of St. Paul in their own home, chickens and all. Sarah has continued to teach Spanish at Augsburg and is slowly working towards a master's in fine arts in creative writing there too. Her children are thriving. Moses is seven, Samuel 10, Mary 14, John 16, and her oldest Anna is 18, and she just started college this year. Sarah has published her poetry in countless journals and is currently looking for a publisher for her poetry collection two blocks from Hope Street. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Sarah. Thank you, River. It's such an honor to, to be invited to be interviewed and to share poetry. And, uh, oh, thank I you, darling. Really well, you know what? I think first we should talk about the giveaway and that um, for the people that have never been to an up close um, interview, it's, it's we play a number game and the, tonight there's going to be two winners um so each each of you here on zoom will have one guest and you have between one and 50 whoever comes the closest to a number without going over is the winner and what sarah has for us tonight are is a broadside of, of a bilingual poem um and yes and that reminds the art for this uh, for this broadside. So it's a it's a collaboration. Um, I wrote the words, and River made it beautiful. It's two sided too. Two sided. English on one side, Spanish on the other. Okay, so 
to start out, we're going to start a little different this month. And I asked, um, since we have a professor here, I asked for a short lesson in bilingual poetry. Well, so this, this poem is bilingual. Uh, when I read it, I like to read both languages um, back and forth um, because I really think it's, uh, it builds curiosity, um, job security for me, uh, people who want to learn, uh, uh, people who want to learn Spanish, um, hearing the language, but not getting too discouraged by um, hearing so much that they can't understand. So I go back and forth between the two languages. Uh, when I write uh, in two languages, I'm thinking about the sound in both, um, how, how it will sound. And also English is my first language. So there are things that I struggle a little bit more to express in Spanish. So I have to make sure that I have the language to say what I wanna say. Um, and then I write in Spanish first so that I limit myself um, to what I'll be able to express. And then I bring it back into English um, where I have more control of the language, more nuance, uh, more detail. Let's see, I don't use italics when I write in two languages because I don't wanna other either language. Um, my brain is pretty bilingual and I, I move through, through the world uh, in, in both languages, I wanna reflect that. Um, I think those were the thoughts that I wanted to share. I think they were to you read, you know, read it for, to us too. Sure. And you read it, when you read it, you read it back and forth. I thought that was kind of cool. Oda al te, ode to tea. Tacita de te, cup of tea. Soplo de aire sabroso, breath of delicious air. Hueles a canela y a durazno. You smell like peaches and cinnamon. Eres el amor puro del corazón de la casa. You're the pure love of the home's heart. Silvando tu melodía de tetera. Tómame. Whistling your call. Drink me in. Se detiene el reloj en tu presencia. The clock stops in your presence. Los contratiempos se destejen. Misfortunes are unwoven. Al escuchar el silencio de la madrugada se derrite el estrés mientras te preparo. Listening to dawn's silence, stress melts as I prepare you. Me llamas cuando estás lista y voy a verte. You call to me when it's time for me to come to you. No puedo beberte sin primero apreciarte. I can't consume you without first expressing gratitude. Adoro tu esencia de velas e incienso. I adore your essence of candles and incense. Te abrazo con las manos. I embrace you with my hands. En una mañana de invierno, me despiertas con jazmín y con bergamota me enredas en tu vapor. On a cold winter morning, you awaken me with jasmine. With bergamot, you enfold me in your steam. Me acompaña tu calor vivo en estado líquido como la encarnación de la esperanza. Your liquid living warmth accompanies me like the incarnation of hope. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So, Sarah, you grew up in Texas, the daughter of a pastor, and homeschooled through seventh grade. I'm curious, when did you... When did poetry come into your world? What age? Who influenced you to read poetry? And who were some of your favorites back then? Well, I grew up in the church singing hymns and the liturgy. So, um, you know, uh, psalms and the poetry of music. Um, my grandmother loved poetry. Uh, she loved reciting poetry, uh, nursery rhymes, Robert Louis Stevenson's A Child's Garden of Verses. Um, my mom is a music director and choir director. And so um, she read aloud to us. Uh, since we were homeschooled, she would read to us after lunch. Um, we would take turns brushing her hair until she fell asleep. And she mm. would read until she launched into some surreal dreamland. Um, and uh, that certainly had a big influence on, on my literary life. 
Did um, you write? It's a pastor, so I wanted the microphone. Um, <laughs> it was five, I think they caught me drawing in a notebook and asked me what I was doing. And I said, I was writing sermons. So steeped in that childhood, I wanted, I wanted to work with words. Did you write besides that? Did you write poetry? Or Well, uh, I started writing occasional poetry because I didn't have any money and I, I needed uh, gifts. And so, for example, when my grandmother had a big birthday or when I needed a card or a gift, um, then uh, sometimes I would write and all my poems rhymed. Um, I also was invited to speak at graduation. Um, my, we moved my junior year, so my senior year we were in Chicago and I was new and nervous. And so um, I wrote a poem, Dear Friends in the Class of 95. <laughs> Uh -huh. rhymed, but it got me through the poem because uh you know a, a poem drives you toward the end and so um, I was a pretty uh, that, speaker oh yeah. uh, I imagine that yeah so now let's fast forward to graduate school I know it's a bit but um when they were training you to be an academic scholar writer the poet in you called out that you didn't want to you didn't want to um write their their papers they'd rather do other stuff yes I, I had to write about 100 pages a semester um in graduate program mostly in spanish and uh, it was all due at the end of the semester and as soon as i turned in that la last paper my reward was to go to the stacks in butler library um and dig into the poetry journals that had been published over the over mm -hmm. the past couple of months uh, to see what what were the po poets up to um, I didn't want to write scholarly work that would um, ask me to take a stance, form an opinion, have an argument. Uh, I, I think I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a writer like the writers that we were reading and, and supposed to be analyzing. But nobody told me in graduate school that I could do that. I did take one writing class um, from Luisa Echenique, uh, a writer from Spain. And... Um, she, we were a um, mixed class. There, you know, um, men and women in that class, but she used female or feminine pronouns to refer to all of us, sort of as a radical feminist act. And I dropped the course when my first paper was due because I was just too scared to to share my writing in public, um, especially in tiny public. Ten. Well, uh, let's fast forward again to you facing the academic board for your three-year review at Augsburg. This time the poet cried out and saved the day though. Yeah, so um, in academia, sometimes you have to interview again for your own job. And uh, more than like a one uh, annual review, um, the third year and sixth year review are, you know, deciding whether to keep you on or, or replace you with someone else. And um, I had a very uh, kind and understanding committee and I came in well prepared. I had all my, you know, I had my speech prepared. And we got through uh, my interview, some questions and, and um, talk about the work that I had done. And the last question, the external reviewer, a professor, a senior professor from the English department said, I'd like to ask you a question that my colleague Bob would ask if he were here. Bob is a professor with a big white beard who likes to take the microphone at faculty meetings and ask the hard questions of the administration. Um, he often advocates for, for faculty rights and um, staff rights and student rights. And I was terrified. What is Bob channeling uh, through the English professor colleague uh, going to ask? And I took a deep breath and, and uh, the professor said, what does Sarah do that gives her joy? What do you do that gives you joy? And my eyes flew around that table I looked at my papers. I thought of my five children. I thought of the two exchange students at home that I was also taking care of, two high schoolers from um, Bolivia and Thailand. Uh, and I, I thought of my chickens and I, I couldn't. And, the, and my eyes landed on my thermos, which is always near me. And I said, I drink tea. <laughs> and then I felt silly and I started to cry. I drink tea. So then I said, I, I, I kind of choked out, I drink tea and I write poetry. 
and then they let me leave so they could talk about me um, and decide whether I should keep my job or keep working there and uh, keep working here. And so um, I went across the street to a coffee shop to wait because they wanted me to come back so they could talk with me again if they needed me. And um, it was April. It was time for me to write a poem a day in Spanish. We'll talk about that later, I think. So yes. I wrote this poem, Ode to Tea. I also wrote an ode to my minivan that day. Mm -hmm. Well, um, before, I, when I asked you when you first called yourself a poet, you told me it was last year. So I waited all of this out the way that I have. So to show you that you've been a poet most of your life, Sarah, and that it's in your blood. Thank you. And I think it's time we hear your favorite poem now. Okay. Thank you uh, mm -hmm. for helping me to see that. And, and uh, this is a poem that I wrote uh, when someone asked me why I protest. Um, and so in gratitude for the village that sustained us, sustain, sustains me and my family here in St. Paul, I wrote, uh, when the revolution. When the revolution comes to St. Paul, I want to be on the side of the child from Saigon who remembers how to hide under the platform bed, feeding jasmine rice to toy soldiers when bombs fall. I want to be on the side of a Peruvian weaver who kept accounts of picuña wool shawls when Sendero Luminoso exploded a bus in Miraflores. With the jazz singer, frozen in grief, whose rolitas de paz sing truth flowing north and south, indígenas a los ríos unidos en la lucha. I want to be beside a baker of tres leches, cakes, and pan dulce, maker of tortas with avocados, mayonnaise, eggs, and beans, whose hands wash dishes, cut pavers, lay bricks, pull weeds. And with a chicken farmer from the highlands of Guatemala who, during civil war, hid the night beneath the belly of a pickup, picked shrapnel from his thigh as morning dawned in El Monte. When the revolution comes to St. Paul, Minnesota, wrapped in tortillas, in banh mi, fear, pupusas, worry, injera, hunger, and tamales, when it all falls in, I want to be with you. Well, we're gonna take a slight little break here, or pause, I guess more to say. And I was, there has been a lot of people that have showed up since we talked about the giveaway. And I just wanted to say, for all that haven't heard it, we're having a little giveaway contest. You can put, um, you can put your guest, you guess between one and 50. You have one, um, one guest, you can put it in the chat. And then um, Sarah has some broadsides giveaway. So um, now, first beautiful art. <laughs> um, now I want to talk about chickens and the beauty of planting seeds. You told me a story about a garden analogy that changed your life. Can you share with all of us? At a time in my life when we needed hope and direction. My kids had a babysitter who was also planning a gardening workshop to teach at the women's domestic violence shelter in town. She was gonna teach permacul permaculture and chicken keeping to women um, with the encouragement to put down roots for mothers to make a home um, for their families. And um, that really inspired me. Uh, it wasn't right away, but uh, I too, grew a garden, learned how to garden, and uh, my kids got chickens. Um, and when we moved to Minnesota five years ago, we had 10 chickens, a bunny, um, and I dug up 40 plants from the yard, threw a maple tree in the, in, in the mini fan, um, and uh, brought, brought, brought our rootedness with us. Well, and that leads right into your book that you have, that you're trying to look for a publisher. Uh, it's a hard world out there, I can relate, but your book is called Two Blocks from Hope Street. Can you explain that and how it relates to what you were just telling us? Sure. Yes, let's see. So um, Two Blocks from Hope Street is a title that, that, that uh, the universe delivered to me. Um, 
pretty obvious, pretty obviously. Um, we, when I was a single mom with three kids, pregnant out of wedlock with a fourth kid, uh, small town, Indiana, it was really hard to find anybody who would rent to us. Um, we were in a two bedroom, um, me and three kids, and they said with four people, okay. But once I was, once I looked pregnant, the, the the rental agency said, you have to get another bedroom. You can't stay here. And so we started looking. I started looking, and um, I couldn't find anybody to rent to us. And um, you know, there are law, there are housing laws, and then there are ways people get around them. Um, you know, to dis discourage a person from from even applying. And so eventually we found a house. Uh, it was it was a month by month rental, um, and we moved in. I was eight months pregnant. We were planning a home birth, and um, walked around the block to check out where the park was and see what was on the other side of the railroad tracks. And we found out we were two blocks from Hope Street. Mm -hmm. And I took it as a good sign. Uh, we're getting there. Life is good. Uh, we're we are well provided for. And then in 2015, um, I interviewed for this job at Augsburg with borrowed glasses, a borrowed computer, uh, clothes uh, that I had just gotten from the resale shop. And um, my little sister and I came up here with, with two kids um, to interview for, for this position. And um, when they gave me the job, I had to find a house. Again, now with five kids, single mom, it took five trips to Minnesota uh, to find a place to rent. You know, I was encouraged to live within a block of, oh, sorry, a block, I wish, within um, a mile of campus. So I looked, you know, in Minneapolis, if you know Minneapolis, you know that a mile, within a mile of campus, there's no affordable housing um, that, that would allow us to have chickens in downtown Minneapolis. And so, <laughs> so um, we rented a place in River Falls, Wisconsin, and then when they saw the size and shape of my family, they returned the deposit. Um, yeah. Eventually we found a house on Third Street. It was a three bedroom with kind of what you could call a fourth bedroom if you didn't measure the window. And um, the, the sewer was torn up. It was a dirt road because Third Street was all torn up. But we moved in and walked around uh, the neighborhood to get to know uh, the area around the Mexican consulate. Um, and uh, we found out we were five blocks from home, Hope Street. And so I, I was pretty sure we made the right choice. We're, I, think, I think we're home. And then uh, in 2017, um, with the help of my grandmother and my mom, uh, we bought a house five blocks away from that house. And uh, now we are two blocks from Hope Street. <laughs> so we found our way home. And that book of poems uh, is the story of how um, a mom and five kids and 10 chickens left Indiana, um, migrated north uh, with a minivan full of, full of plants um, to start over in the land of milk and honey where we live now. Oh. I myself every day, we live in Minnesota. Well, that's a great, great title and a great story. Um, the next is we, um, every April you do the National Poetry Writing Month. How many years have you been doing this challenge and can you give us like the gist of what it is? Yeah, Napo Rimo, or some people say Glopo Rimo for global. Um, National Poetry Writing Month is the month of April. I try to write and a bunch of people try to write 30 poems in 30 days. Um, I started out doing that in maybe 2010 or 2011. Um, I wrote in Spanish um, to invite my students in April at the end of the semester to save their grade by writing for extra credit, uh, a poem a day. Mm -hmm. And I've never done 30, but I kept a blog for a while um, of poems in Spanish. Um, and so well, that's, um, and how many years have you been doing it? So maybe 2011, I know I can think of a 2011 poem I wrote when I was pregnant with Sammy. Um, so That's, probably about a decade, yeah. but I, I, some years I only get three or four poems. A good year is 10, a good year is 10 poems in April because it's- Now you bring, 
you bring your students in with to with the challenge. Yes. So. Yeah. Now I teach a writing class in Spanish here at, at Augsburg, and my oh. students are writing memoir. And then at the end of the semester, we have a literary reading. So I really end both semesters with with some creative writing. That's cool. Yeah. Well, and you started a project this summer. And the idea of the structure of it came from a book about sonnets. Can you explain the book and what your project is? Yes, uh, starting in May, um, I started writing about laundry. You can imagine um, a mom, of, a single mom with five kids has a pretty fragmented life and I write best in community. So I like writing um, when I'm in workshops with other people, um, generative workshops or shared writing space. And I can only get away for a little bit at a time um, to do some writing and I end up with a lot of fragments. And I've been taking those um, sometimes in the nice weather out in the yard to sit under the clothesline um, and trying to grapple with the challenge of getting the laundry done. Um, and so um, there's this book of poems that I love by Terence Hayes. Um, it's an amazing, structurally, uh, it's an amazing book um, written in the first 200 days after Trump was elected and grappling with US history um, and the history of, of racism. And um, it's called uh, American Sonnets from a Past and Future Assassin. And the way it's structured is I think 40 sonnets and then the last three or four sonnets are the table of contents. So once you read to the end of the book, you realize that the last poems are the first line of the whole book. It's an amazing uh, structure. I mean, it's just a masterful work of, uh, of creation. And um, so I was thinking about this summer, you know, what can I do with all of these fragments about laundry? Um, and yeah, my life is, is one that spins around and sometimes it feels like a patchwork. And um, so I decided to settle on a sestina, which is a collection of, it's a, it's a poem based on six words that are the end uh, of each line and then they rearrange in different order. So I settled on these words, sort, wash, dry, fold, put away and wear, which is kind of what we do. Um, with the joys in our life, with the heartbreaks, uh, with the traumas and the terrors. Um, so that's what I've been writing this summer. And it's, it looks about like a big pile of laundry in the basement, uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot of fragments, but um, I'm trying to give it some order. Oh, cool. Well, guess what, Sarah? We have time for that one last question. Okay. Great. So um, you were homeschooled through seventh grade. And then um, you really wanted to go to school. So you did um, did a, a mother trick, I don't know, kind of caught her, got her in the corner. And, and then can you tell us the story all the way to what the, what the school did? Sure. My mom's here. I put all those gray hairs on her head too. Um, uh -huh. So um, let's see. Uh, well, yeah, I in in uh, eighth grade or so, my closest friend moved to Lubbock, and my other close friend went to public school, and so I, I wanted to be like the other kids. So it was Texas; it was hot every day. We went to the the community or the you know the city had six swimming pools or, or so, and so we were standing in the kiddie pool, and I went up to my mom and said, "Mom, I'm going to school this fall." And if you don't let me, I'm going to call the truant officer and turn you in. <laughs> My mom's big fear was the truant officer coming uh, to our house to find that she wasn't a perfect mother, but she was pretty darn close. And um, so this mother who got up every day at 4 a.m. to do her job, her job for money, um, a, an accounting job for an insurance agent and uh, a choir directing and church musician job and practicing um, 
early in the morning so that by the time the kids woke up, she would be ready to, to give us her undivided attention. Um, she let me go to school. And the school journalists wanted to interview me and my mom to get a sense for, for this conflict. Oh, here's a story. Uh, <laughs> and um, I told my version, mom told her version, they printed it in the school paper. But uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a big change. Uh, it was a big change to go from being uh, um, homeschooled to public school in eighth grade. Oh, I bet. I started learning Spanish. Uh, well, I had started in the park district um, before that a little bit. Because of where you lived and stuff. Yes, I had a, there was a lot of Spanish-speaking uh, community also in, in, in our church and in the neighborhood and in the community. So I was pretty much surrounded by Spanish in the borderlands, broadly defined. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's that concludes the end of the interview part. Now Sarah's got um, a reading for us that she's prepared. And then after that, we will do the giveaway. So, and also if anybody's got any, any questions, if there's time at the end, you can put them in the chat and, and um, we will dive into those. So go. Great. So this one is about my mom. It's called Holiday Dazzlers. Since we grew up and left home, Christmas has never been the same. There's that photo in the photo album of the suburban preteen Texas years. Four homeschooled kids dressed as Joseph and Mary. I'm holding a doll. A shepherd swings a staff at my head. I look demure. He misses the shot. My baby sister is white as an angel, hair electrified by her own powerful presence, blonde, Rats, nap time nest, her only helmet against terror, her eyes full of otherworldly fire. Mom rented a sheep and a cow, took pictures of every kid in the Sunday school dressed as a manger scene. Holly's mom nearly stabbed me with bobby pins that day to keep a veil over my hair. Mom, who never slept past 4 a.m. in those days, recorded our voices in harmony, caroling, Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Um, I started writing about laundry, I said, in May. Um, and I wrote this one sitting outside um, in the, under the clothesline. The assignment was from Corporeal Writing, which is out of Portland, Oregon, and I was in a workshop. Um, and the assignment was choose a photo and write about that photo and, and um, something about how you felt in your body or how, that, how, how, that, how you felt at the moment of that photo. And I couldn't pick one, so I picked about 10 pictures. And uh, airing dirty laundry. Thumbing through old photos, my gut wrenches up like a ball of wet rags while my arms go numb as a shirt in the wind. Dad sits on the tractor, peaceful beside the clothesline, holding the youngest grandbaby curled like a folded towel. I grin so hard my helmet might split and raise a gloved hand in hello, peering from the bike trailer. My kids in t-shirts crouch in front of sheets of waterfalls gritting their hostile teeth as water sprays everywhere. Mom straddles an ancient bicycle, flip-flops dangling beneath a red skirt, thin legs relaxed. She still remembers how to smile. My brothers stand atop a sand pile, boxing gloves flying, a mess of mohawks, denim, beads, sweat, and rage. I flip further back in childhood, I stand half naked, clad in, a, clad in a cloth diaper, inches taller than the spotted bull terrier. I cling to mom's pant leg in the rocking chair, safe as socks. I'm surrounded by laundry, bubbles, and dog piss. The pictures sit frozen in an album four lives away. I sip fizzy water, wipe up a puddle, 
and throw in a load to spin against time. Um, this next poem was a prompt from a friend on Facebook um, who said, write, uh, write a poem or write something creative um, defining your gender as something in nature. And so I wrote, my gender is, and this is published in Pithead Chapel uh, this year, early this year. My gender is, my gender is more animal than vegetable or mineral, domesticated, wild, created. My gender is a pit bull who doesn't know indoors from outdoors, who shakes in thunder and hides under porches, who jumps fences and breaks glass doors to cuddle in under quilts, who rides shotgun in the minivan with all her people. My gender is a bathroom cat who meows for more affection, clean water, more food, meows and meows for more and more and more. My gender is a middle-aged Craigslist rescue bunny who sleeps in the weed patch by the compost pile and spends nights holding vigil under a street light on the median, who munches on clover and dandelions day and night, greeting the neighbors with softness and trust. My gender is a hen who cackles in the face of danger, who sits in protection over eggs that may never hatch, who races and hobbles and pecks in search of enough while holding the vision for an economy of abundance. My gender is a homing pigeon who whispers and coos and hovers over the water, over the coop, over the fledglings, who longs for the babies to grow up, who yearns to be far away only long enough to come back home and find them all safe, warm, happy, and well. Wow, that was that our, your last one, Daryl? I have one more that I can read. Um, you want to read that one? You can. I could, or I could read it if people want to ask questions. I could read it. Last. Oh, we have time. You can read it. Okay, I'll read it now. It's called Riven. Um, you'll like this one, River, because it's about a river. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes with an epigraph at the top. There is a river whose streams make glad. Psalm 46, 4. I covet blue ink rather than all these memories spilled on my skin. I want mermaid hair to cascade over forehead and nape where a fist splashed fear over my entire future. A water ribbon to snake the geography of my earthly survival. Rapids to churn over a muscle the size of my fist, pump life through the middle of me. What would they charge me? to stream a trickle of ink over shoulder blades, down my spine, turquoise circling the hip with a full labral tear that hurts hot as sand. A blue filament of truth on my sleeve might slip down a wrist, ring round a finger, disappear under a nail I'd once bitten through from the wrong end. The quick grew back when I got free. A waterfall splits at my core, tumbles down thighs, jumps knees, and puddles over scalded skin scarred by tea above the arch of my left foot. Water pools in my shoes, the wet slog of witness, this granite grandeur sliced river of life. Uh, that's quite nice. Um, okay, well, I guess we're gonna move to, on to Julie. Julie, have you, do we have any winners? We have winners. All um, right. Becky and Leanne hit it on the mark. Wow. Yeah. Really? Wow. That, that's, <laughs> one got which one? Becky got 30. Leanne got 44. Mm -hmm. Wow. How about that? So both of you can put um, in the chat or maybe you already know their their addresses but they're both a little bit out of town so okay so if you, if you can put address, their i can mail it if that would be okay 
send it straight to um straight to sarah in the chat private message to me yeah, yeah. or a private message on facebook or however you want to send me your address cool you want to show them what you're they're getting yes so it's a broadside my poem ode to tea bilingual spanish and english um and uh rivers art rivers uh, art on the broadside to to give it a frame so becky you're a spanish professor that's perfect oh yeah, i should resist <laughs> yay cool okay so um julie are there any questions that anybody's put in that in the chat um let's see what does it feel like to you to think write and speak in Spanish compared to English? Are certain thoughts or feelings or poems more possible in one language than the other? If so, why is that, do you think? This is coming from Kirsten. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I think I've been bilingual for as long as I can remember, or at least I've I've been able to navigate in Spanish a little bit. I, I thought I was bilingual when I moved to Barcelona. And uh, wow, I talked like a textbook. Um, and I people treated me like a little kid. But um, <laughs> what is it like? Um, well, it is like having an extra floor of your house or an extra room or you know having a, an attic. Um, to have another language, uh, it's 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 expansive. Um, it's a break. It's a place to rest. It's a language with different set of baggage um, than English. I, being in a homeschooled family, I did want, as I became a teenager, I wanted my own space to think my thoughts and. Um, I was a little nervous about writing in a journal because I was a perfectionist and I thought, oh, if I write it down, I have to write every single day. I didn't think, so I started a lot of journals and then if I missed a day, game over, uh, I'm a failure. But um, Spanish was kind of a safe place to, to think thoughts that I wasn't sure how they would be received. I didn't wanna make a mistake, but I, I think that perfectionist in me too, um, I had high expectations of my English, um, but I gave myself permission in Spanish to make mistakes because it wasn't my first language. So if it wasn't perfect, at least I was trying. And so uh, it was a language for me of experimentation, of play, um, of creativity, of talking around what I didn't know how to say And Spanish is a beautiful language. The, the sounds, the rhythms. Um, I, I think it's also a very funny language. When I was in grad school taking the Don Quixote course, I took three different courses on Don Quixote in my undergrad and grad school. And it's just a funny book. I mean, Spanish is a language that you can bend and twist and take words and put them together like a puzzle and, and make up new ideas. And that's part of the joy of, of Spanish is um, that it is such a playful language. And so I couldn't read Don Quixote. I lived in New York City and I couldn't read Don Quixote on the subway because I laughed out loud so much that people thought I was <laughs> crazier than I wanted them to know I, I really was. So yeah, so those are some thoughts about, about Spanish. Okay, here's also, another question. It's also a challenge that it's not my first language and I want my kids to be bilingual. When I lived with their dad, we mostly spoke Spanish at home. And uh, now they're in Spanish immersion school. But um, when they were little babies and I'd try speaking Spanish with them, it was like talking to the house plants or it was like talking to the rabbit. Uh, it just felt like, what are you supposed to say about this? I don't know. I mean, I can say something, but it sounds like I'm making it up because I wasn't mothered in Spanish. But then there are some things like I learned rock climbing and mountaineering in Spanish and I can't car mechanics, all that stuff is, is stuff that I learned in Spanish. And I don't really, I don't think about it in English first. So. Okay, another question from Anne. Do you write fiction 
or creative nonfiction to these days? I took a Spanish language course from Gisela Kozak, um, feminist writer from Venezuela. And I wrote a short story in Spanish, but it wasn't really fiction. It was, it was nonfiction. I just twisted it around and gave the, the two characters opposite roles. And uh, I got to be the bad guy. Um, in I, some way, I trust myself to write fiction because I, though I, though I love to lie, I don't feel like I'm good at it. Um, I hang around with smart people who, who are also very ethical, and I know fiction is not lying. But I, I struggle with being able to. I plus life is so interesting. I like to write nonfiction. Um, when I write nonfiction, I think my mom gets a little bit nervous. Mom, can I say that? I don't know. I feel like people don't want me to pull skeletons out of the closet. I have a pretty dramatic life. Um, and so, you know, truth telling, if it's going to be journalistic, but when I write poetry, um, no one's expecting the truth in a poem. So I can be my full self. Fragmented, quirky, emotional. So poetry is probably home as a genre. I also really like a hybrid genre a lot. Uh, it's, everything goes. I like braided, less, braided essays and lyric essays and uh, creative nonfiction, but I also don't, tr I don't trust myself to tell the truth. So, mm -hmm. Do you translate your poems? Does one language feel more poetic than the other? This is coming from Becky. I think things sound better in Spanish, but I don't have as big of a vocabulary in Spanish because it's not my first language. So if I want nuance, I use English. Um, I have to slow down. I, my brain goes pretty fast. I, you can tell just from listening to me, I jump around, I'm all over the place. And so Spanish slows me down. I have to actually think about what I'm gonna say. Um, so sometimes I think my poems in Spanish are more meditative or reflective because they, I have to take the time. So sometimes look up a word or just puzzle it out. Did that answer your question? Did I miss part of it? Becky. Yeah, could I just ask uh, related to that, uh, did, do you read a lot of uh, Spanish poets or Latin American poets, uh, contemporary, not contemporary, women, men? Uh, I've read a lot of poetry in 44 years. Um, I, uh, I, poetry is, is like medicine for me. Um, I think in grad school, I read a lot of Latin American poets. I thought about being a Latin Americanist. Um, and I read, I took as many poetry classes as I could. Oh. I have recently read some Central American poetry. Um, I've been reading everything that's published recently by Milkweed Editions and Coffee House and Grey Wolf, um, you know, uh, Copper Canyon, um, the poetry that's coming out right now while I'm in grad school. Um, that's I've been interested in, in that. Um, but I, and, and certainly an earlier foundation in my early 20s in grad school um, was, was Spanish language poets. And then my dissertation is on a um, medieval topic. I wrote about the Cantigas, Las Cantigas de Santa Maria, 13th century uh, Galician text um, compiled by Alfonso X, uh, who was King of Castile Leon during those years. And so, um, yeah, and then and I took exams on golden age Spanish poetry. I needed a, a dissertation advisor who would let me be a mom. So that mm -hmm. influenced me choosing. It was a hard choice. I, I waited to the last possible min minute to declare, you know, whether I was gonna study medieval poetry or modern Latin American poetry. It came down to choosing a dissertation advisor that was, you know, someone I really could relate to as a person and um, 
supportive of this idea to leave New York City for Indiana. Maybe, yeah. Is that, was that our last question? That's the last question in the chat, unless. Um, okay, well. Or hold, or hold on to them. Um, let's see here. Next, that's, that would conclude our interview with Sarah then. It's so it's fun to gather with all of you. River, thank you for getting us together and for the opportunity to share poetry and um, this is a gathering of many of my favorite people. Um, mm -hmm. So much fun. Um, well, you know, with some new friends and some old friends and my seven-year-old, eight-year-old camp counselor <laughs> from Texas. Well, you know, how about how members about of we... writing groups, uh, La Leche League leader who helped me learn to breastfeed my first, second, third kid. Um, <laughs> Well, let's from the MFA let's stop. program and writing groups. Some of you are writing group uh, buddies. A bunch of you are in different writing groups with me from MPWW, Eastside Freedom Library, um, Writing Circles for Healing, uh, some Spanish professors, um, mentors. Well, let's conclude this and you can sit and talk with them on Zoom. Awesome. But we have to, okay. yeah, we have to stop this. Otherwise, they're going to be on Facebook doing it. Ah, got it. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if everyone wants that, every, the whole world to see. Um, but next month, uh, up close, we have Matt Mouch. So that will conclude this. Um, whoever wants to stay around for just a little, just a little bit can chat with Sarah. But give me a minute here to stop the live.